Did you know that using nonlinear regression in research is considered out of line? You get it? Off the line. So now we're looking at predictions, residuals, and the least squares regression line, also called LSRL. So the data below is from a tedious task in one of my stats classes, and L1 represents the number of digits being typed into a calculator, and L2 is the time to the nearest second to complete the task. We need to determine the explanatory and the response variables. Well, in this case, the number of digits explains the time. So the explanatory is digits, and the response is time in seconds. So what does A represent on the screen output? That is actually the coefficient of x, so that is the slope or rate of change, and it represents the marginal change of the response variable for each unit change in the explanatory variable. In this example, we can say that for every increase of one digit, so every increase in the explanatory, we expect to see in this case an increase, because slope is positive, of 0.517 seconds. So do we expect it to be negative or positive based on the graph? We expect it to be positive because it's increasing, so that looks like a positive slope. What does B represent? Well, B is a predicted y-intercept. Now, we did do one example where we had the Barbies and zero rubber bands, and you notice that B on the regression didn't match the height of the Barbies. Well, that's because that's a predicted value. And so it's not necessarily the actual value. So if we're going to write down the least squares regression line, we're going to say that the amount of time in seconds is equal to the slope times the number of digits minus, and this, or plus the y-intercept, which in our case is actually negative. You can see that little negative sign right there. Okay, So that is the least squares regression line for predicting the time based on the number of digits. Now, in our example, Pearson's correlation coefficient for the regression model is R, which is 0.926. Remember, this is unit list. R does not have units. And 0.926 is definitely considered strong, and it's definitely positive. So the coefficient of determination, this is a new term for you, is actually R squared. And what that does, and you're probably going, well, does that mean it's just R squared? Yes, it is. So the cool thing is if you square 0.926, et cetera, you get 0.85795, etc. So that's R squared. It's called the coefficient of determination, and, and it represents a percent of the variability in the response variable that is explained by the explanatory variable. So in other words, um, the 4 going all the way up to 32, in our case, 85% of that is explained by 10 going all the way up to 60. So in this example, 85.8% .8 of the variability is accounted for in the linear regression model using the number of digits. Now, if I want to know unexplained variation, I just subtract that answer from 100%. We can also use the model to predict other times based on the number of digits. So if I was to predict the amount for 25 digits, I would just basically use the slope and the y-intercept and substitute in 25, and I would get 8.325 seconds, which makes sense based on the data that I have here. All right. Now, if I wanted to do 1,000 digits, I substitute in 1,000, and I get 512.4 seconds. So how comfortable am I with this? Actually, I'm comfortable when I'm within the original data, a range of data. So for the 25 digits, I'm totally comfortable. But outside of it, not so much. Why? Well, if you're doing 1,000 digits, you're probably going to get tired and need a break. So the model starts to break down when you start having a lot of digits. So we are comfortable with interpolation because those predictions are within the original range of data. We are less comfortable with extrapolation because those predictions are outside of the original range of data. So let's go ahead and look at the statistics teacher. He gathered data on the number of hours students played video games and their GPA, and he did a scatter plot and linear regression, and here are the outputs from the calculator. We want to write down and interpret the least squares regression line for predicting grades. 
So based on the number of hours spent playing video games. So I have my A and there's my B. So GPA is equal to 91.5 minus 0.678 times the hours spent playing video games. How do I interpret that? Well, usually we focus on the slope. So for every hour a student plays video games, we expect their GPA to decrease by 0.678 hours. Notice we say expect, we do not say that the GPA will decrease. This is just predicted. And then I'm saying the average GPA for students who don't play video games is predicted to be 91.5. I cannot say that the GPA will be 91.5 if they don't play video games because there's natural variation and you can see it in the data points right here. So the strength and direction of the linear regression we have to look at R and that would be negative 0.58 that would be negative for sure and it's between negative 0.5 and negative 0.8 so we'll call it moderate. What percent of the variabilities explained them by the model? We look at R squared and so in this case I move the decimal over two places 34 percent of the variability and GPA is explained by the number of hours played. So what grade would we predict for a student who plays uh, video games for eight hours? Well, I just substitute in A and I get 86.08. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and talk about residuals. These are the difference between the actual and the predicted. So you can say the residual equals Y, the actual, minus Y hat. That little hat means that's the predicted value. So we know in one case, one student did play video games for eight hours and had a GPA of 80. By the way, we always have to give you the actual. You can't normally calculate the actuals from the two data, uh, the coordinates for that data point. But we can calculate the predicted. So we did, and we said it was 86.08, but the actual was 80. So actual minus predicted is negative 6.08. How do we interpret that? Well, the actual, and it's easier to say the actual one first, is 6.08 points below the predicted value of 86.08. So a negative residual means actual is below. Positive residual means the actual is above. Now we can also determine appropriateness of a linear fit by plotting the residuals versus the explanatory variable. The model is appropriate if there is no pattern in the residuals. If there is a curved pattern, then a linear uh, regression isn't appropriate. So here what I did is I calculated all the residuals and then I plotted them versus the x values. And as you can see, there's no real pattern here. So yes, a linear fit is appropriate. Is a linear model appropriate for the residual plot shown here? And it says on the right, but it's actually on the left, sorry. Uh, and we would say no, because there's definitely a pattern here. There's some sort of extra association going on besides the linear one. So just because the value of R is close to one or negative one doesn't mean that a linear fit is appropriate. Always refer, refer to a plot of the residuals or at least the original scatter plot. But if you can do a plot of the residuals, that is better. So let's go ahead and explore this lesson. So first of all, what are residuals? Residuals are the difference between the actual y value for the data point and the predicted y value for the data point. So I created this line right here and I'm going to try to use it to do a best fit through these points. Now <clears throat> I do know that the best fit line needs to go through the mean mean point. So this is the mean of all the points in my set. I'm going to go ahead and click here and that shows the residuals. So what do you notice about these residuals? Well, here I'm making the residuals bigger because my line is predicting the data will behave like this when you can see it's not really behaving that way. So what I'm going to want to do is create a line that makes the residuals smaller. Okay, so the smaller those are, the better my fit. And I can show you a residual plot here and your calculator can do a residual plot. I'll show you how to do that in a little bit. So you can see that these differences um, are plotted down below my graph and it just so shows how far the predicted is from the um, actual. So point A, it, when you have a positive residual, you can see the points actually higher than predicted. So when it's higher than predicted, that's the individual residual. 
so if I can, if I go like this, you can see that there's actually a pattern here to the residuals and we actually don't want a pattern. The better our fit is, the less likely we'll see a pattern in the residuals. It'll look more like normal scatter. Okay. Um, so one thing we can do is we can actually look at, I could try to add up all these residuals, but um, it's not going to be really interesting. So what I'm going to do instead, and in fact, they should probably add up kind of, but not quite close to zero if it's a good fit. This is not a good fit, so they're not going to behave that way. Okay. So when I do this, what I'm doing is I'm showing residuals, um, the squares created from residuals. So when I square the original residual here, 1.25, if I square it, I get 1.55. And the thing I'm trying to do is make sure those squares are really small. So to do a least squares fit, what I can do is I can move this line and you can see I have the sum of the area of the squares here. I can move this line until that sum gets really small. And when it stops getting small, then I have, here we go. Oh, now we're getting bigger. So I'm going to kind of slide it back down by four. That's about as small as it gets. So my best fit is somewhere around here, somewhere in by four. Now, um, the smaller the squares are, the better the fit. So I adjust the line till the total area of the squares is minimized. And what that ends up with is the same line as my linear regression. So this is the calculated line that we learned how to do last lesson. So a linear regression is often called a least squares fit because we're trying to make the squares as small as possible. So what do the squares represent? They represent the squares of the residuals. And what happened with R when we adjusted the line to minimize those squares, the correlation became stronger. So we maximized it. And variance, the explained variance, was also maximized. So the least squares regression line is the line that minimizes the sum of the squares of the residuals. Now let's go ahead and look at one more example. I want to show you how to read computer printouts. Uh, a survey of the North Sea over a 25 year period, 1977 to 2001, shows that as sea winter temperatures have warmed up, fish populations have moved farther north. And here are the data. All right. And it shows the latitude here and the temperature for the water. And you can see that there's sort of a linear pattern right here. And when they ran the output, this is a typical computer output that you might get. Um, this is what they got. So how do we figure it out? Well, first of all, the constant here, you're going to see something called the constant. That's your y-intercept. And then the next number under coefficient is actually the coefficient. That's your slope. You don't have to worry about these other numbers for right now. The standard error of the coefficient, the t-value, or the p-value. We'll revisit some of these later at the end of the year when we're almost done with the course. But for right now, we're just worried about this column. Now, the other outputs you might see that are also important are S, which is actually your standard deviation of your residuals, R squared, and R squared adjusted. Now, this one actually ignore. This is if we have more than one variable explaining, and that is beyond the scope of this course. So the main thing you're looking from over here is R squared. So if we write down and interpret the equation on the line for the least squares linear regression, remember that's my y-intercept, that's my slope. So temperature is equal to 0.5935 times latitude. See how I'm referencing latitude there? Minus the 27.596. And to interpret it, remember we can focus primarily on the slope. For every degree increase in latitude, the temperature increases by 5935, 0.5935 degrees Celsius. Now R squared is 58.42%, which is R squared. So let's go ahead and take the square root of it. Now here's a very important thing. My slope up here is positive, so I want the positive square root. If my slope was negative, then I would want the negative square root. But since it's positive, we're sticking with positive and changes to a decimal. Don't keep it as percent. And I get R is 0.764.
So based on the scatter plot, I would say it's linear. And based on the value for r, I would say it's moderately strong. Then last but not least, let's go ahead and look at the residual plot. Is a linear fit appropriate? Yeah, I don't really see any real patterns in it. So we're going to say yes. We do not see a pattern in the residuals, so a linear fit is appropriate.